introduce you ma'am uh, yes. then we'll start the session right okay yeah and we'll take the questions at the end of the webinar right okay okay so good evening doctors i'm dr someshwar from shield healthcare i welcome you on behalf of shield thank you very much for joining today's webinar i kindly request all the participants to post their questions in the comment box so that at the end of the talk we'll have a short q and a session and uh, uh, today's topic is on thin endometrium in art so let me welcome dr sri devi madam and uh, dr vidya r and dr c v e kanaki ma'am so today uh, uh, we're going to have a uh, three topics and the three eminent speakers so let me introduce first our dr sri devi madam who is talking on etiology of thin endometrium and investigations for it so dr sri devi she have uh, done uh, her medicine from kilpock medical college and md from kasturiba medical college mangalore and she is a gold medalist in md and uh, she is a consultant uh, uh, ops and gynecologist at devi hospital uh tamari fertility center sela uh thank you very much ma'am for joining us uh today's webinar and uh, over to you ma'am yeah okay good afternoon everybody so uh, we will now uh, give our uh, views on thin endometrium i'll start off by uh, talking on the etiology pathophysiology and diagnosis of thin endometrium dr vidya prem will uh, talk on the treatment options and dr kanak utaraj our expert in all uh, aspects will give us the final message so thin endometrium has always remained an enigma it always a cause of worry uh, for art uh, physicians uh, it's mainly because the endometrial thickness is always considered an indicator for endometrial receptivity and this is very important for a successful implantation and pregnancy if we uh, talk about the clinical importance of uh, endometrium and its thickness uh, we always believe that a good endometrium is essential for a very close dialogue uh, with the blastocyst thereby aiding successful implantation the endometrial receptivity during the window of implantation mainly depends on the endometrial thickness the pattern the endometrial and subendometrial blood flow and the endometrium is usually hostile to the embryo except during the window of implantation why does a thin endometrium we feel result in lower implantation there are certain theories which go with this one is probably an an estrogen receptor abnormality or a dysfunction hypothesis there can be an oxygen tension theory or an impaired angiogenesis or altered blood flow which may be the reason if we take the vascularity of uh, the uterus we have always uh, we know that the uterine and the ovarian artery are the smooth and then uh, we get the arcuate arteries from that and a uh, running uh, uh, radially from the arcuate artery into the myometrium we have the radial arteries which give off the basal arteries and the spiral arteries into the endometrium so what happens here is that there is a high impedance to the blood flow in the uterine radial arteries and this could probably be a trigger which impairs the growth of the glandular epithelium and the glandular epithelium is probably the one which secretes vascular endothelial growth factor and when there is a decrease in uh, the growth of the glandular epithelium it's very natural that the vascular endothelial growth factor expression is also reduced and this low level of vascular endothelial growth factor probably causes poor vascular development and this in turn decreases the blood flow to the endometrium and this is a vicious cycle the diagrammatic representation is very clear here it shows that there is a decreased uh, blood flow because of the high impedance in the radial artery and that results in a, a, a poor glandular development and a thin endometrium and this in turn produces reduced uh, vascular epithelial growth factor and in turn uh, again uh, results in a vicious cycle reducing the blood flow and resulting in a thinner endometrium so this is probably uh, the vascular uh, uh, agenesis uh, defect which probably results in a thin endometrium then again we have the reduced oxygen tension theory whereby a thin endometrium does not allow an embryo to develop properly uh, if we see 
there is the intermediate being divided into the function layer and the base layer. The base layer has got a lot of spiral arteries which carry more blood flow than the function layer, which is uh, filled with capillaries and uh, have a uh, reduced uh, flow in the capillaries compared to the spiral arteries. This reduced flow actually has a, re um, a decreased oxygen uh, concentration and thereby a reduced uh, reactive oxygen species, enabling the embryo to grow well. So what happens when the endometrium is very thin? The endometrium is uh, the embryo is placed very close to the basal layer of spiral arteries, which carry more oxygen, and this does not favor embryo development. This is probably the reason why we feel thin endometrium may not be uh, very helpful for an embryo to grow and develop well. The supportive evidence probably comes from the triple gas incubators, which use low oxygen concentrations of 5% to aid embryo development. And the implantation, which occurs in the fallopian tooth or the peritoneal surface, where the oxygen tension is likely to be quite low, is probably uh, the reason for uh, better embryo development. If we take chlorophyll citrate, we uh, see that it mainly affects the steroid receptors of the endometrium, the late proliferative phase, and this is probably resulting in a receptor effect of the endometrium um, and resulting in thinner growth. In the mid segmented phase, the chlorophyll citrate generally causes a low grade pattern plate 3 endometrium, which is not very favorable uh, for the growth of the embryo. Now, if we uh, summarize, we can uh, know that the thin endometrium may be because of the endometrial resistance to a certain endometrium because of a uh, receptor defect um, or a receptor insensitivity. It can also be because of a reduced blood flow to the endometrium, which we saw in the angiogenesis theory, or it can be because of overexposure to androgens, or it can also be because of a permanent damage to the basal layer. What are the diagnostic tools to diagnose thin endometrium? Can be invasive or non invasive. If you take the invasive uh, methods, the endometrial biopsy uh, is one where we can use it for histological dating around the mid luteal phase. It probably, um, the disadvantage is that it, uh, at biopsy uh, causes an inflammatory or injury reaction that could alter the gene expression. Previously, it was thought the presence of menopause, which were uh, supposed to appear and disappear uh, around uh, the time of the window of implantation, uh, to be used as an indicator for um, uh, uh, to note the receptivity of the endometrium. But then it's later on found out that it's, it's a feature which is very unique to rats. And in humans, the menopause developed shortly after ovulation, but did not disappear with the window of implantation. But rather persisted right into the first trimester of pregnancy, making it not a very useful tool to uh, diagnose the fertile period. The next most common thing which we all use uh, to uh, know a thin uh, endometrium, to detect a thin endometrium, is probably the ultrasound. This is uh, probably the standard of care everywhere, and uh, the ultrasound is very helpful in um, noting the uh, in, uh, noting the volume, uh, volume and the thickness of the endometrium, the pattern, and the subendometrial blood flow can also be studied with the ultrasound. Uh, to evaluate the endometrium, it has uh, the transvaginal ultrasound is probably a rapid and a non-invasive means. And uh, we generally uh, check the endometrial thickness in the sagittal plane, and the thickest part of the endometrium has to be measured. The ultrasound also gives us uh, the pattern of the endometrium, whether it's a trilaminar pattern or it's a uniform or non multi layered pattern. So now, coming to the main question how thin is thin? Less than 7 mm is generally taken as a thin endometrium. And why are we so worried is that the main advantage of measuring an endometrial thickness is because of its very high negative predictive value. Some authors have suggested that endometrium of 6 mm or less is associated with 100% negative predictive value for conception. The only limitation of the endometrial thickness is that its positive predictive value is poor. Now studying the endometrial patterns, we have three types of patterns. Type A, B, and C. If we take the type A, this is a triple line pattern consisting of a central hyperechoic line surrounded by two hypoechoic layers. The pattern B is an intermediate isoechogenic pattern with the same reflectivity 
specifically as the surrounding myometrium and a poorly defined centripogenic line. Pattern 3, which is a non receptive bar endometrium, is a homogeneous hyperechogenic endometrium. The endometrial evaluation whereby is by the functional biochemical markers, it's also by histology and assessment by ultrasound transvaginal 2D, 3D, Doppler, MRI, and hysteroscope. It is very important that we repeat a thin endometrial measurement because they can be an intra observer variability. They can be trying contractions which alter the thickness. If we take uh, the changes in the because the uterine contraction sometimes cause changes in the endometrial thickness uh, of up to 3 to 4 mm due to changes in the myometrium and the subendometrium. Most patients have multiple contractions per minute, and the periodicity differs with the stage of the cycle. The supportive uh, evidence for uh, the uterine contraction is that, uh, like the vaginal progesterone administration. Uh, which we give for luteal support uh, generally quietens the contractions and we've always seen increased pregnancy rates uh, with the blastocyst transfer uh, which is actually uh, uh, done after two days of extra exposure to progesterone. Probably this uh, reduces the contraction frequency and thereby uh, increases the uh, pregnancy rates. So normally the contractions are at a maximum on the day of the alien surge, and uh, they go uh, down to an adult around the mid luteal phase. In donor cycles, uh, we have seen up to a 9 to 10 mm of our thickness is considered optimal, and but sometimes even 6 mm conceptions do occur for uh, to the surprise of many. There is no evidence so far that an increase in estrogen therapy better thin endometrium. When we uh, look at uh, the Doppler of the endometrium, we always uh, tend to uh, see the subendometrial blood flow and a good subendometrial blood flow generally is associated with better pregnancy and implantation rates. The higher uterine flow rates is associated with positive pregnancy outcome, whereas an absent diastolic flow is associated with no conception at all. 3D ultrasound can be used uh, whenever the endometrium is very thin or uneven. When uh, and 3D ultrasound uh, results are generally accurate and reproducible and is less operator dependent. Evaluating uh, the volume of the endometrium in 3D uh, probably helps us to more accurately uh, note if uh, the endometrium is uh, receptive or not. The factors which limit the accuracy are fibroids, the adenomyosis, polyps, uterine orientation, body habitus, previous surgeries, machine quality, and patient intolerance. There have been a meta-analysis done to study the relationship between endometrial thickness and the outcome in IVF cycles. 14 studies uh, were included with 4,922 cycles, and it has always been shown that the mean endometrial thickness is higher in patients, uh, in pregnant patients, than those who were who became uh, not pregnant. So this is another uh, uh, 22 uh, randomized controlled trials were included at the uh, age groups of 30 to 35 between them. And the endometrial uh, thickness cutoff was 7 mm as uh, in the majority of trials, and the pregnancy outcomes and the ROC analysis were reported. It was found that uh, the clinical pregnancy for women with endometrial thickness less than 7 mm and in women uh, with uh, endometrial thickness greater than 7 mm were compared, and the probability of clinical pregnancies was significantly lower for women with endometrial thickness less than 7 mm. If we take age into criteria and endometrial thickness, uh, it was found that in the group with the endometrial thickness less than 7 mm, the mean age is higher and the mean number of retrieved insights were also lower compared to those with the endometrial thickness more than 7 mm. There were studies that showed that the endometrial pattern and not the thickness affects the 
implantation aids in diploid embryo transfers. 277 patients undergoing uh, fresh or frozen embryo transfers were studied, and uh, the endometrial thickness uh, uh, and patterns, uh, which were the one, two, and three, which we had uh, described earlier, were studied. And uh, it was found that uh, the pregnancy rates were significantly lower with pattern three. And pattern three generally signifies a closed window of implantation. There were studies which uh, showed the relationship between individual thickness and the outcome of medicated frozen embryo treatment cycles. And it was found that uh, the endometrial thickness of 8 mm and higher released higher clinical pregnancies. This is also another study which shows that the clinical pregnancies and live birth rates were improved when the endometrial thickness more than 8 mm. This was valid for both the young and the advanced age women. So, in summary, there is no, though there is no solid conclusion on the optimum endometrial thickness cutoff, it does appear that the T7 mm of endometrial thickness is essential both for fresh cycles and the frozen raw endometrial transfer cycles. So, what causes a thin endometrium? There are many causes. It can be a dramatic event to the uterine mucosa, which is very common. Or it can be age related, hormone related, it can be the blood flow related, there can be trauma resulting in nationals, hormones can be the cause of infections, tuberculosis, drugs like clomiphene citrate, long postnatal use, and unknown etiology also plays a part. So, if we uh, uh, study the gravid and non gravid causes, there can be like you know, miscarriages uh, without, without curatage, curatage after postpartum, post abortion phase. Hemorrhage um, uh, after uh, a delivery, uterine embolization procedures can be uh, the reasons for a thin endometrium uh, after a gravid uh, uh, state. In a non gravid state, uh, it can be a surgical hysteroscopy, resection of myoma, pollen, or uterine sector, infections or genital TB, radiation, or prolonged post use more than 10 years can result in a thin endometrium. What happens um, in uh, retained products of conception is that the myometrium is softened by the pregnancy and is often accompanied by a low grade infectious process. And this uh, traumatizing effect of a sharp curatage can contribute uh, to the likelihood that a full depth of endometrium will be removed. So, uh, the reasons uh, for damage during PNC is because of. Uh, it's usually unlikely, but it is quite possible that the passage of instruments can cause damage, perforation, puncture, hemorrhage, infection, scar tissue, cyanic A or intrauterine additions. There can be a permanent damage to the basal endometrium, and uh, this can uh, occur due to the severe endometritis or due to the vigorous curatage following abortion. A persistent thin endometrium should always be evaluated for latent tuberculosis as the incidence of genital tuberculosis is very high in our country. So for all practical purposes, we must uh, know that a completely damaged basal endometrium cannot be regenerated. So in Ashman's, what happens is that there is a failure of the endometrial functional layer to regenerate because of the deep trauma involving the myometrium and the loss of the basalis endometrium and its population of stem cells. So when we have studied uh, the mean endometrial thickness uh, between patients who have undergone PNC and uh, to those who have not undergone the PNC, it has been shown that uh, there is a significant reduction uh, in the endometrial among the patients who have undergone BNC to those who have not. There have been studies comparing the number of BNCs performed to the endometrial thickness, and it's been found that with every BNC performed, the endometrial thickness, which later uh, develops, is comparatively smaller compared to the people uh, who have undergone less number of BNCs. So the endometrial thickness of uh, five to seven days after ovulation in patients with uh, estradiol, varying estradiol levels and progesterone levels were studied. And it has been found that there is no statistical difference between the levels of estrogen and progesterone to the endometrial thickness. 
So when we uh, see that endometrial thickness differences uh, on uh, different age groups, less than 20, 20, 30, more than 30, it has been uh, shown that there's no statistical uh, difference in thickness. So if we go to the pathophysiological changes in a thick endometrium, uh, as we have already discussed, it is like the uterine artery resistance index and the radial artery resistance index uh, have been measured. Uh, and we found that the resistance index uh, is generally uh, like higher in patients with endometrial thickness, uh, which are less than 8 mm, compared in the main uterine phase, compared to those with endometrial thickness more than 8 mm. So this is uh, probably the study uh, which shows that there's a significant reduction in the uterine artery resistance index and the radial artery resistance index. Whereas uh, with the uh, hormone uh, levels, varying hormone levels of estrogen and progesterone, the endometrial thickness does not show any statistical a significant um, difference in size. So um, this is probably uh, the changes in the resistance index in the radial artery, which happens uh, throughout the menstrual cycle. Um, and it has been uh, seen that uh, in the mid luteal phase, uh, the people with thin endometrium had uh, higher resistance uh, in the radial artery. If you see the gland development, and uh, it is also, uh, it can be uh, seen that uh, the glands, glands are uh, uh, in thin endometrium are comparatively less, and the blood vessels are also comparatively less developed. The same goes to the vascular endothelial growth factor protein expression, which uh, was analyzed by Western Block, where there has been reduced glands and vascularity. The expression of the protein has also uh, been significantly less. So, in thin endometrium, to summarize, the radial artery resistance index is significantly higher than in the normal endometrial group throughout the menstrual cycle. The endometrial thickness was significantly correlated with the radial artery resistance index. The growth of the glandular epithelium, the number of blood vessels, and the vascular endothelial growth factor expression were significantly lower in the thin endometrial group. So, there is a constellation of signs and symptoms of thin endometrium. Patients can present menstrual dysfunction, hypoamenorrhea, infertility, and pregnancy loss. The hard facts remain that the healthy seed uh, just is not enough to get a healthy plant unless it's grown in fertile soil. And similarly, a healthy embryo needs a receptive endometrium for successful implantation. So it is not just important to um, select the best seed, but it's also important to prepare the best soil and plant in the appropriate time and uh, it is very important to think uh, different to achieve greater pregnancy rates. So the future obviously is like we have to have novel biomarkers to delineate the window of implantation and uh, probably this will be discovered in the next few years and uh, newer ultrasound techniques to monitor endometrial development and contractility um, and uh, probably newer therapies to enhance endometrial thickness and implantation uh, should follow soon after. By doing all this, let's hope that we improve birth rates in assisted reproduction. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the excellent and uh, very detailed talk on the investigations uh, and the etiologies for the thin endometrium in ART. Uh, Ma'am, we'll take the questions from the delegates at the end of the webinar. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so now we have seen the etiologies and investigations. And uh, let us go for the treatment modalities in the thin endometrium. So let me welcome uh, Dr. Divya R., uh, who speaks on uh, the treatment modalities. So she have done her medicine from the, uh, Madras Medical College and MS from uh, Kasturiba Medical College, Mangalore. And she have done her fellowship in uh, fertility from CIMAR. And also she is a consultant, uh, obstetrician and gynecologist at uh, Sri Ganapati Nursing Home and Tamarai uh, Ramchalam Fertility Center, Tirpur. Uh, uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, okay. Dr. Vijayan. Uh, so, yeah, uh, over to you, ma'am, for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you for the kind introduction. 
Sri Devi, ma'am, that was a very informative talk and that has made my job easier. Now, the topic for today's discussion is treatment modalities for thin endometrium. Now, why should we treat a thin endometrium? Endometrial thickness is considered as a marker for endometrial receptivity. And this endometrial receptivity acts as an important prognostic factor for success of our embryo transfer in IVF cycles, which all of us want. Therefore, adequate thickness of the endometrium is very much crucial for a successful pregnancy. Now, importance of endometrial thickness, whenever the endometrial thickness is between 9 to 14 millimeter, it is always associated with a better implantation rate, better clinical pregnancy rate, better ongoing pregnancy rate and a live birth rate when compared to the counterpart with less than seven millimeter of endometrium. So another meta-analysis showed that uh, studied the mean endometrial thickness of the preg pregnant group and the non-pregnant group. It has seen that the pregnant group, the mean endometrial thickness was significantly higher. Therefore, the treatment of thin endometrium does increase the pregnancy rate. Now, what are the modalities of treatment? We have a lot of, a lot of options in treatment, which means to say that nothing is very satisfactory. So we have hormones, we have vasodilators, vitamins, pentoxifilin, GCSF, autologous uh, platelet-rich plasmas, stem cell therapy, personalized, uh, ERA-based personalized transfers, endometrial scratching, steroids, heparin, immunomodulators. Let us go into each one of them. First, estrogens. Now, endometrium is a hormone-dependent tissue, and the estrogen supports the endometrial proliferation by causing spiral artery contraction and by decreasing the oxygen tension in functional layer. So there are a lot of preparations uh, seen, but the endometrial um, uh, estradiol valerate appears superior to all other preparations. Why? Because the estradiol valerate is similar to that of the estrogen, uh, uh, sex hormone estrogen. There are a lot of roots, namely the vaginal, oral, and transdermal roots. And uh, uh, even with estradiol valerate, the micronized forms appears better because of better dissolution, better absorption, and marked increased bioavailability and desired clinical efficacy when compared to that of a plain estradiol valerate. Now, how to start and how to uh, give the estradiol valerate? Generally, estradiol valerate is started uh, as two milligram three times daily as a constant dose on the second day of uh, the cycle, and it is continued for about 12 to 19 days until the endometrial thickness is around uh, seven millimeter. The uh, extent there is, ex whenever the endometrium is thin, it can be extended even up to five weeks with no much significant difference in the endometrial receptivity. Now, uh, followed by the progesterone, depending on the day of the embryo. And once if the uh, woman gets pregnant, then uh, uh, it should be continued for eight to 10 weeks until the placenta becomes autonomous. So there are uh, two ways of giving estradiol valerate. One is a step-up uh, dose, another one is the constant dose. The step-up dose is started as two milligram uh, from uh, second day to fourth day and uh, four, increased to four milligram from five to eight days. And it is changed to six milligram from ninth day onwards until the endometrium becomes seven mm. Uh, if the oral route doesn't work, vaginal route can be tried. Uh, a constant dose is one in which the two milligram estradiol valerate is started uh, three times daily right from day two and continued till the endometrial thickness goes up to more than seven millimeter. There is a study in human reproduction in 2016 saying that uh, the constant dose is better in the way that it is simpler to administer and it is less stressful. Otherwise, the estrogen replacement protocols could be adjusted based on the patient characters and preferences without much significant differences in the reprodu reproductive outcomes. Whether it's a constant dose or a step-up dose, whether it's oral route or vaginal route doesn't make a big difference. But the constant uh, dose uh, is, be is uh, better accepted by the patient because it is less stressful and simpler to administer. Next hormone is HCG. HCG has got local paracrine role in the endometrium. It helps in differentiation and it helps in improving the receptivity by regulating the cytokines and growth factors. It is given as 150 international units daily for seven continuous days starting from eighth day of the cycle in which the estrogen has been started on second day. It can also be continued up to, uh, I mean, it can also be continued until the endometrium reaches up to seven millimeter. The rationale behind using HCG is that HCG administered can have positive effect on HCG LH receptors in the endometrium. So apart from increasing the thickness by 20%, it 
it is said that HCG also has a role on improving the endometrial receptivity. So there is an article in Fertility Sterility in 2013 uh, showing that follicular HCG during the uh, follicular HCG given during the uh, follicular phase does improve the endometrium. 150 international units of HCG uh, uh, endo does the endometrial uh, priming has a highly pr promising role, not only in improving the thickness, but also eventually in improving the endometrial receptivity. Next hormone is the GnRH agonist. The actual underlying mechanism of GnRH agonist is not clearly understood yet. Probably it is because of uh, uh, pituitary suppression and decreased circulating estrogen. The, it reduces the concentration of the peritoneal metalloproteinases, therefore downregulates the peritoneal fluid inflammatory proteins, promotes apoptosis and expression of pro-apoptotic factors. Therefore, it is mainly used in uh, stage 3, stage 4 endometriosis and adenomyosis, uh, where there is a prominent aggregation of macrophages within the superficial endometrial cells, which may interrupt the endo embryo implantation. So pituitary suppression with GnRH agonist decreases implantation rates. So now how to give this GnRH agonist? One milligram per day of GnRH agonist subcutaneously started on day 21 of the cycle preceding the actual FET cycle. Following the second day of uh, cycle, the dose of GnRH agonist is reduced to 0.05 milligram and simultaneously estradiol val rate 2 milligram is started three times a day. When the endometrial thickness reaches about 7.5 millimeters, the vaginal supplementation of progesterone facilities is started as 400 milligram twice daily. When we start progesterone agonist is stopped. Next are the vasodilator drugs. First is aspirin. Aspirin has always been considered as wonder drug in medicine, mainly in general medicine. And same idea of uh, aspirin has been tried in, uh, uh, in endometrium too. 100 milligram of aspirin every day has been uh, given as an empirical therapy. And uh, aspirin is an uh, anti-inflammatory drug and has an irreversible cyclooxygenase enzyme inhibitor. It decreases the pulsatility index of uterine artery, thereby increasing the blood flow to the uterus. However, the Cochrane study shows, the low, uh, shows that the low dose of aspirin has no much uh, prognostic effect on the pregnancy, improving the pregnancy rates or the endometrial thickness. Next is the sildenafil citrate. It is a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. Uh, sildenafil citrate augments the action of nitric oxide on the vascular smooth muscles. Sildenafil, along with estradiol valerate, leads to proliferation of endometrial lining, regulates cell growth, angiogenesis, and therefore facilitates implantation. It is given as 100 mg per day and in divided doses of 25 mg vaginally, four times a day, started from day three until trigger. Sildenafil acts on the endometrium producing nitric oxides, which causes relaxation of vascular smooth muscles and then therefore increases the blood flow. The protocols it is started from day three to day 10, or it is started from day eight to day 12 for five days or until trigger. The dose is 25 milligram per vaginally, once in every six hours. That is basically 100 milligram per day. There are a lot of studies uh, supporting vaginal sildenafil that they do increase the endometrial thickness without much systemic side effects. Next is oral uh, L-arginine. Oral L-arginine imp uh, improves the uterine blood flow and endometrial receptivity and implantation. It uh, acts by a nitric oxide. Uh, it is actually a nitric oxide donor. It relaxes the vascular smooth muscles of the endometrium, thereby improving the uh, radial artery resistance index by 89%. It is given as a dose of 1.5 grams four times a day. That's a maximum of six grams started from day one or day two until trigger. Next, we have high dose vitamin B. That is 200 milligram, uh, three times daily vitamin B orally is started. It is uh, uh, sh said to improve the resistive resistance index RA of the radial artery by 72%. Vitamin E is said to improve the growth of glandular epithelium by improving the vascularity and vascular endothelial growth factor. Next is the pentoxifilin, which is a xanthine derivative. It has been commonly used in general medicine, uh, mainly to improve the intermittent claudications, basically an antifibrolytic medicine. It is said to improve the endometrial circulation. It is given as 800 milligram per day. Next, we have GCSF. Now, what is this GCSF? GCSF has been described as a hematopoietic growth factor. They have a direct role in promoting the endometrial growth. Normally, the human endometrium expresses 
granulocyte colony stimulating factor messenger RNA and its receptors throughout the menstrual cycle. This helps in the endometrial development by interacting with the cytokines and also the ovarian steroid hormones like estrogen. So what is the rationale behind using intrauterine GCSF? Human endometrium contains small amount of mesenchymal stem cells, which is responsible for the cyclical endometrial growth and reconstruction. Whenever there is a diminished number and function of endo endometrial stem cells, it would affect the endometrial growth. Injuries to the endometrial cell growth may result in pin endometrium. So by giving granulocyte colony stimulating factor, it would stimulate this endometrial stem cells or mobilize the bone marrow derived stem cells promoting the endometrial growth. What are the routes of administration? It can be given intrauterine, subcutaneous or intravenous. It comes as one ml vial containing 300 micrograms of GCSF. So what are the protocols of giving granulocyte colony stimulating factor? One ml, that is the 300 micrograms of uh, GCSF is introduced two to seven days before uh, embryo transfer into the uterine cavity using an intrauterine, I mean IUI catheter. Um, in fresh cycles, it can be given on the day of HCG, 6 to 12 hours before. Or in FET cycles, it can be started on 12th or 13th day of the cycle if we feel that the endometrium is less than 7 mm. After 48 hours to 72 hours, it can be re reassessed. And if we feel the endometrium is still less than 7 mm, one more time it can be repeated. Now, this granulocyte colony stimulating factor treatment in a resistant endometrium in frozen thought cycles has been studied in 2017, and they showed that GSF infusion leads to improvement in endometrial thickness, but not to any improvement in clinical pregnancy rate or live birth rates. So GCSF infusion into the endometrial cavity does increase the endometrial thickness within 48 to 72 hours, though the results are low, but reasonable clinical pregnancy rates are recorded. Endometrium is basically a highly regenerative tissue. The regenerative potential is comparable to that of bone marrow, epidermis, and intestines. So uh, this thought has been put up in treating the endometrium with pla uh, platelet-rich plasmas and stem cells. So what is this platelet-rich plasma, which is, uh, uh, which is being talked of more often these days? This platelet-rich plasma is nothing but the aut uh, autologous platelets are activated which would result in release of growth factors, namely the platelet-derived growth factors, vascular endothelial growth factors, transforming growth factors, fibroblast growth factors, and epithelial growth factors. What, these do, what does this growth factor do? They help in development of the endometrium. Now, how do we prepare this uh, platelet-rich plasma? It is platelet-rich plasma is instilled usually 48 hours before endometrial transfer, before, em, uh, sorry, before embryo transfer. Uh, initially, the patient's platelet count should be normal, and uh, uh, a 10 ml of the autologous venous blood from the patient is taken. Um, uh, it is uh, centrifuged. It taken in a, uh, the blood is taken in acid citrate solution and uh, uh, it is centrifuged twice. Once with uh, around 1500 RPM for 10 minutes. Once that first centrifuge gets over, we get a, a buffy coat and a, a plasma, which is again transferred to another tube. Again, we do a recentrifuge for, for about 1000 RPM for 10 minutes where we get a pellet, which is rich in plasma. Now this pellet is about 0.5 to 1 ml is instilled into the uterine cavity and the thickness is assessed 48 to 72 hours later. And if we feel the thickness is uh, less than 7 mm, even after 72 hours, we can repeat once again. The contraindications are low platelets or when the patient is anemic or if they have other metastatic or associated infections. So that is a very uh, supportive article for this in 2015, but with very minimal patients, where five women who had uh, refractory thin endometrium have been studied, and they have been started with 12 milligram of estradiol valerate, 12 milligram, that is uh, uh, the usual dose is six. It has been started as 12 milligram in this patient, in this group of patients, and on day 10, PRP was done. And surprisingly, it was given that all the five uh, was positive for pregnancy with one missed abortion. Um, next is a stem cell therapy. It's, a, it's a, something like a regenerative medicine. The non-endometrial stem cells, such as bone marrow-derived stem cells, can produce endometrial regeneration. So this is not actually new. It may be new for uh, uh, reproductive medicine, but CD133 bone marrow-derived stem cells have been indicated in clinical trials uh, in non-hematological applications for neoangiogenesis in limb ischemia, post-myocardial infarctions, 
following for endothelialization of vascular grafts in vascular surgeries, atherosclerosis, and in uh, ophthalmology. Currently, uh, this same concept has been used in Asherman syndrome, uh, where uh, it has got very uh, massive, uh, there is a massive interest in stem cells in treating Asherman syndrome. There is a very interesting article uh, published uh, uh, by the, the Spanish article where they studied around uh, 16 patients with Asherman syndrome and they have uh, given very positive results uh, for the stem cell therapy. But here, the stem cell therapy is given. Uh, now, what, what does the stem, uh, stem cell therapy do? Um, sorry. So what does the stem cell therapy do? It decreases the fibrotic area and elevated, it increases the number of glands, it stimulates angiogenesis, and it enhances the thickness of the endometrium and uh, it helps in formation of tissue construction. Now, what, what is done is the autologous blood is taken and the cells are sorted out using a, a separate sorter. And uh, 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 CD133 bone marrow derived stem cells are derived. And with the help of interventional radiology, these cells are something like our uh, uterine artery embolization. These are uh, sent via the femoral artery using catheters and deposited in the uh, Oh, radio, I mean, spiral arterioles inside the uterus, thereby uh, creating a stem cell nike in the endometrium, which is uh, which appears promising to increase the uh, uh, which causes betterment of the endometrium, improving the endometrial thickness. Next is the endometrial scratching, and how does this work? Now, the rationale behind endometrial scratching is that it rec recruits the stem cells of present in the endometrium, creating a partially new endometrium, totally free of these epigenetic changes. This healing promotes the sort of inflammation, which is favorable for implantation. Now, when do we do this endometrial scratching? It is usually done seven days before menstruation, that is in the luteal phase of the cycle. You uh, it is done with the people. The studies uh, have shown that the follicular phase uh, uh, endometrial biopsies of index cycles does not have much benefit. Today, most of the fertility specialists have started doing this because it has no much harm. There are, uh, neuromus there are other therapies like neuromuscular electrical stimulation. The group of pelvic muscles have been stimulated using electrode, which is uh, said to improve the uh, pregnancy rates and endometrial thickness by uh, 60 percentage. It has been used as an effective method in uh, uh, other uh, situations like chronic pelvic pain, stress urinary incontinence and sexual dysfunctions and constipation. This is also tried in uh, thin endometrium, something like our acupuncture. Next is uh, ERA, that is the endometrial receptivity array-based personalized endometrial transfer. As uh, Sri Devi Madam has uh, pointed out, that endometrium works becomes uh, receptive in a particular window that is called the window of implantation. Now, this endo endometrium is usually hostile for the embryo except during this window of implantation. So when the endometrium is, appears thin, uh, uh, despite all these treatment, ERA is done to assess the receptivity. So ERA is a molecular diagnostic tool where we study around 238 genes and the transcriptomic signature of the human endometrium is studied. Uh, thereby, we try to predict the personalized window of implantation. Now the report comes either as receptive or, no, or non-receptive and we transfer it based on the receptivity. Other empirical treatments like low molecular weight heparin, corticosteroids, intravenous immunoglobulins, and intralipids have been tried, but they are not effective, henceforth not advocated. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for the excellent talk on uh, treatment modalities, the thin enometrum in ART. Uh, it was an uh, informative uh, uh, lecture. So we'll move on to the... Uh, the literature uh, backing the thin endometrium evidences. So let me welcome Dr. C. V. Kanake, ma'am, uh, who is a very eminent speaker. And uh, actually, she doesn't need any introduction. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. C. V. Kanake, ma'am. Uh, she is the director uh, at the Fertility Center, KMCH, Coimbatore, and uh, coming to Oh, she has completed her MD and DGO from Madras Medical College and uh, University of Madras. 
and she completed her art training at uh, national university hospital with uh, professor ss ratnam and xc training at uh, staten uh, clinic and uh, yeah, you can keep training. all that uh, yes sir keep all that okay uh, yeah you uh, can go to the topic yes sir and she is also director of samurai fertility center uh, and uh, it's uh, situated in various places across the tamil nadu uh, and also she is a examiner for fellowship program in reproductive medicine arjitsh university bangalore and she is a examiner for uh, national board of examination india and she is a past president of kolmato og society and scientific chair uh, icer national conference and scientific chair you of oxy so with this uh, let me welcome you ma'am uh, so over to you on your presentation for the literature yeah. now i am share my screen um. So make sure. Uh, yes, ma'am. I do a share screen. Are you able to see my screen? Oh uh, no, ma'am. Oh, Chitrakala, could you able to guide the uh, doctor? Oh, uh, ma'am, you have a share screen option in the video. Yeah, I have a share screen. I'm going on that, and then it's going asking for my file. Not able to put my. Oh God. You are able to see my screen. Oh no, ma'am. Actually. Not yet. Oh, ma'am, when you click on the share screen, uh, just click yeah. on the screen. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, there's only uh, uh, my basic advanced files. I'm not able to get the thing which I have minimized. Now, are you able to see? Oh, uh, no, ma'am. What do I do? Can I send it to you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm just uh, texting you, ma'am. In the sh
हेलो Uh, now we can see the screen. can go to play, right? Yeah, that's fine. You all can hear me? Oh, yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and, yeah, sorry for the delay. Uh, oh, no. the slides, uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Please go okay. ahead. Uh, yeah. In endometrium and fertility treatment, we have, uh, I thank you, Dr. Sridevi and uh, Vidya, for making my job very, very simple. And I think you've gone through the literature yourself there. And I'll be just touching upon some very relevant papers and coming to a conclusion as to what we should be doing. Um, this is so, so that's how you go when you try to literature review. And with the internet, it's even more confusing. And so first I thought we'll take the most popular guy, the platelet with plasma. And let's look at some recent studies. And this is from uh, China in 2017. And it's, uh, it's a relevant study because it has a case control study. And um, it shows that the administration of PRP has benefit in a frozen blastocyst uh, embryo transfer program. Uh, it showed the thicker endometrium, lower cancellation rate, and a higher implantation. So that's one of the uh, studies that says latest 2017. 
Now here is a very interesting study coming from our own country. This is Professor uh, uh, Reddy from Sanjeev Reddy from Ramchandra Medical College and uh, autologous PRT. And this is uh, again in frozen embryo sponsor cycles. Um, that is uh, what the study showed was a significant increase in the thickness of the endement at Matthew, where the p-value was 3.003. But it was a non-randomized single arm trial. That means they did not have a randomization of the treatment, nor was it a uh, uh, case control study. So it's a less weaker study, but yes, it does show a increase in thickness. But the ongoing pregnancy rate the, when, they, when you studied that, it, there was no difference in the treated uh, group. And then um, this is one step further they went, and this is an ongoing study where they have injected the PRP into the endometrium hysteroscopically. And uh, this study, again, is from Fertile Steroid Nature Study 2020. It's an ongoing study. We still don't have results. Let's look at it when it comes. But still, it's an invasive way of putting in the PRP. And uh, then we also look at a different source of the platelet rich plasma uh, that's from the umbilical cord blood. They are, I mean, you know that the umbilical cord is very rich in stem cells also. So the, the umbilical cord blood can have more factors than a plain um, platelet factor from the patient. But here it becomes heterologous. And therefore, the question of transmission of uh, diseases, transmission or, and, or any anaphylaxis, all those issues may come in. Mm. This is a study coming from in the most recent one, 2021. And uh, uh, this is um, so using the umbilical cord blood. So the next uh, girl in the block is HCG. Uh, you heard um, the Dr. Vidya talk very elaborately on the HCG usage. And let's look at what and let's look at the studies. This is a very uh, a group, a very important group that is Humidin and Papanicola et al. These researchers have said in, uh, when they injected the uh, HCG as uh, described by uh, Dr. Vidya, 17, there was a, in 17 persons of the patients, there were endometrium went over 7 millimeters. That is 1 in 5 nearly, 1 in 5 or 1 in 6 showed an improvement. 17 persons showed no increase at all, uh, rather. And uh, out of the 17, uh, seven delivered. So that is, that is still good for considering the small numbers. It's still a good number. If you can get 17 of the same endometrium, if you could get seven of them deliver, it's still good. Now, the next player is, uh, you heard Vidya talk about it, GCSL for the grandicide colony stimulating factor. It's something which acts by a second reaction of stimulating several growth factors. And uh, if you're looking at the literature on that, there's uh, plenty of literature, transvaginal endometrial, uh, 2012 paper, 2013, um, and a randomized clinical trial also was uh, conducted in 2014. And the conclusion uh, was in normal IVF patients, GCSF does not affect the endometrial thickness, implantation rates of clinical pregnancy. Because these are results, these are mainly given for older patients. They may not necessarily apply to the younger women. There were pregnancies, but nothing, no significant difference in the pregnancy rate. Now, there, there is another study where they gave GCSF uh, along with PRP, and uh, they showed the two arms where the two protocols uh, and this is again a signing study published in RBM. Mm, and uh, the, if you give the GCSF shown, you can see the ultrasound pictures there where there was a very thin endometrium and infusion of uh, GCSF that arm uh, showed a definite clinical pregnancy rate. But again, one follow doesn't make a summer. We have to do long, bigger trials, bigger numbers to end, end this to part of the study and therefore can be more concrete conclusions can be drawn. Still, there is something uh, which we could use for uh, something we can offer to the patient. Now, next, coming to the most exciting area is the stem cells and the material reconstruction from stem cells. And these stem cells, the source can be from embryo, from the menstrual blood, even. 
to be surprised at the number of uh, cells that can be obtained from the menstrual blood. Then from the endometrium itself, we can obtain biopsies and grow stem cell cultures, and circulating progenitor stem cells can be used, and heterol organs, uh, umbilical cord, uh, both the embryo and umbilical cord stem cell, derived stem cells would be heterol organs, whereas the menstrual blood, the endometrium, and the circulating progenitors, and the bone marrow stem cells, they, they, are, they can be autologous. And here is a nice picture on the, uh, the bottom. You see the human uterus. They showed the use the human embryonic stem cells. And you can see the endometrium uh, starting to form there. And these are all very promising, but more at the research front than at the bedside as of today. And this is a paper from even from 12, 2012. They are doing a lot of research in this area. Now, the next uh, area we're looking at, apart from the cells, we are looking at the blood flow. And Dr. S. P. Devi very elaborately showed how the radial artery and the influence of the blood flow in the radial artery, the various things that there, which we can measure with the ultrasound, has a, a predictor of um, uh, implant, has a predictor of uh, uh, endometrial growth. And uh, this is the uh, and therefore, since this is a main player, the radial artery blood flow, a lot of uh, substances or molecules uh, which enhance the um, blood flow have come in. That is the vitamin E. Uh, you heard uh, Dr. Vidya talk about vitamin E, sildenafil, L-arginine. These are all basically nitric oxide donors. And they promote the radial artery blood flow, endothelial growth, endometrial growth, and they uh, increase the secretion of the vascular endothelial growth factor. But however, the studies are still very small. Mm, you have the uh, pilot studies, and here you have the, uh, some of them do show the implantation. But again, we need a double blind randomized trial to say, um, yes, it works definitely. But when we don't have anything to offer the patient, these kind of agents might still uh, click in some of them, and there is no harm in offering these drugs to the patient. However, um, on the flip side is uh, a polypharmacy where we have, you know, everything on the earth on the prescription, and we don't want to do that. So that's why we are looking at studies and deciding what would be the best for that particular patient. Uh, Pentoxyphylin and vitamin E. There has been a case series again reported in 2007 by the uh, Okusami group. And again, uh, they uh, show uh, that this combination of pentoxy and E has reported to improve the endometrial parameters in radiation induced and idiopathic endometrial insufficiency. So that's one It has been speculated that increased platelet flexibility. And decreased aggregation improves the blood flow to small capillaries in the endometrium. So this sediment with minimal risk provides a potential avenue for the endometrial infection. So this is another thing we can offer. And validate estradiol, of course, we do it. And it does work well. The basal layer is fine. Endometrial estradiol validate does work. And we all use it for frozen embryo transfers. And where the endometrium, even in other cases where the endometrium is thin. And uh, tamoxifen also, if you're doing a non ARTI cycle, leave alone the ARTI cycle, instead of clomiphene, which causes a thin endometrium, tamoxifen is a better alternative. And uh, with tamoxifen and gonadotrophin, in a thin endometrium patient, you can get a better endometrium in the cycle. Gonadotrophin, uh, the for a poor endometrial from exogenous. Suppose you're not able to develop with estradiol, we do use gonadotropin, and some of them do bloom up with gonadotropin. It may be not only because of the, um, uh, of the estradiol uh, increase because of the gonadotropin, it can be because of the direct effect of the gonadotropin on the receptor in extra gene expression in the endometrium, as we see with STG. Now, let me share a few cases. Which uh, you know, which defeats all kinds of uh, theories sometimes. Not uh, not in all, but this is a primary gravida, a young primary gravida who had a dead bone uh, features. He has referred to 
our hospital for embolization. We did the uterine embolization and uh, uh, saved her from, uh, saved, uh, brought her out of the critical state. And then she, of course, went into amenorrhea, amenorrhea for years, two years. And um, we, uh, the, the follicles came back, the ovaries uh, jumped back into um, regular function, but we were not able to get the endometrium up. And uh, we, so we said a radiation menopause, probably not really a radiation menopause. It's more of a, a endometrial failure post radiation. And the ovaries were okay. So we received her oocytes and had she had a surrogate program. And uh, her own sister acted as a surrogate. And we delivered the baby. And we said, okay, fine. You may not even need contraception because uh, um, your, uh, there's no question of your endometrium holding another pregnancy. And fact, she came back when she was about, uh, when the child was about eight years, she had conceived spontaneously and came back to me uh, for big vomiting. And we never suspected a pregnancy. However, when the vomiting did not stop with the usual measures, uh, did a scan and we found a pregnancy there. So this is something, again, never writes off anything, either the ovary or the endometrium. We've also seen many cases where the primary ovary, we declare the ovary as, uh, uh, as, a, as it is uh, functionally ineffective, and they pass, they come back with a pregnancy. I've seen one even at the age of 43, she taken uh, she back with her own pregnancy. Now, this is another patient who we had frozen the embryos. And we were battling and battling with the endometrium for 11 months nearly with estrogen. Uh, this is long back, so we did not have the other things in our armamentarium. So it was estradiol and progesterone. And uh, suddenly, the 12th month, there was the endometrium bloom. And then the, we went forth and put, put in the frozen embryo. And she got, had a uh, frozen embryo transfer and a live birth. So just again, don't give up. And um, so what, what, what do we have? Uh, there is another uh, lady, again, uh, she was about 50 years old and was wanting a donor program, had a horrible skin endometrium. This is a, say, a four or five mm, it wouldn't grow up. And even on a, it looked so slightly, but we had no choice to put it back. And then she did go ahead and deliver her uh, baby. So these are three instances where, uh, you know, the endometrium really gave, we gave up on the endometrium, but the endometrium did not give up on the pregnancy. So never uh, take the ultimate for the patient. Uh, you keep her hope alive. And uh, the, uh, so with so much of data as a deluge there, so what do we have? Do we have any guidelines? So when we looked at that, there is the guideline coming in from the Canadian Society, uh, clinical practice guideline uh, from the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society in 2019. And if you look at the common substance of it, it is uh, there is no evidence that either of the stimulation protocol, either mutual estradiol or aspirin or silenafil or Pintoxy, or GCSF, or PRC, uh, is, um, or stem cells as far as now, as, as of today, have no, uh, uh, have no really great effect showing a statistical uh, difference in the pregnancy rate. So they're all empirical treatments. So how do we go about, um, in a thin endometrium, we have to counsel the patient the ground reality of what we are able to do. Don't give her false hopes with uh, uh, CRP or stem cells or whatever. But still, if the patient is willing to travel with you, you can do the more uh, dramatic treatments like bone marrow stem cells or, or you, the lesser uh, invasive ones like CRP or GCSF or even the least invasive ones like pentoxifiline, vitamin LRP, etc. So it's a highly individualized approach we should have. But then we should tell the patient there are no miracles out there. Uh, I think uh, counseling is very important in thin endometrium. Thank you very much. And uh, we can go on to the discussion or the questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, 
Hello. Oh. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for a wonderful uh, lecture, ma'am. Oh, it's always an honor and learning to hear you, ma'am. Hello. Pardon? Uh, it's always an honor and learning to hear you, ma'am. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, ma'am. So far, no questions. Uh, just we'll wait for some time. Um, ma'am, we have one question. Uh, uh, how long we can uh, administer the estrogen in the extended support? You mean after embryo transfer? Is it that? Uh, yes, ma'am. How long we can? Uh, Sometimes after, after the thing, actually, the placenta takes over between nine to eleven weeks, right? So till then, you definitely need to go ahead. But we generally go on till about 12 weeks at least. After which, there's enough flesh and estrogen to support the pregnancy. Thank you, Anshan. There's another question. Is, uh, I, I mean, another way of look. Uh, I don't know if they meant this. That is, um, how long can you go on giving estrogen to, to the end point of uh, 7 and then? Um, there have been people who have given for even a month or so, even more than 21 days, and then it is, uh, you know, the very refractory cases, we can go up to three to four weeks. I'm so tempted to try this uh, bone marrow cell sensor. I have a patient who is waiting um, for months. Uh, she's come down from the US. She's got uh, she's young. She's got uh, she uh, she has some tuberculous endometritis, and only the upper half of the not even upper half, upper third will show a triple line. The rest of the cavity is like one short straight line. And we are trying everything for her PRP and DCSS, uh, uh, so all the uh, HMG given, pentoxifiline, not pentoxifiline, vitamin D. And now there's no, she doesn't want to go for any surrogacy. But the upper half looks nice. So after this talk, I'm so tempted. We have a, a facility for arterial perfusion, uh, we have a bone marrow unit. So why not try? I must, but I must tell the risk of an arterial embolization I mean, getting into the invading the uterine artery. But I think as a last resort, before going to surrogacy, she can uh, hope that she's uh, willing to try that. Because it's so so sad to see her every time she come and look at my face while I'm scanning and ask me, Madam, is it okay? And uh, it's very sad. Oh, ma'am, we yeah. have yeah, one question, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is, uh, what is the cutoff value? Six, eight, or seven? 
see, you start off to see, Devi enumerates that seven, uh, you know, she eats at least seven mm and triple line. That's an ideal one. But sometimes, if you're able to get a good triple line, even six is fine. And eight is really excellent. It's, I mean, it's not only thickness, it, it looks, you know, the classy uh, three lines and uh, the measurement is both coincide, you don't have to hesitate. But if you're finding the thickness is not that great, then but you're seeing the triple line, you can go on with the estrogen for some more time. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I don't find any additional questions. So if you allow yes. me, then we'll close this webinar. Any questions are there, then we will pass on to your mail ID. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, for your thank you, thank you, Sri Devi, and thank you, Vidya. Your presentations were excellent. I learned so much from them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Rather inspired to do the bone marrow now. <laughs> let you know. Uh, thank, thank you, Sajita, and thank you, Sameshwar. Uh, especially uh, when I was technically challenged in the first part of the presentation. Thank you for the help. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, we are pleased to have you all here, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sri yeah. Devi, ma'am, uh, Vidya, ma'am, and Kanaki, ma'am. Uh, oh. We'll uh, uh, look forward for your support for this uh, educational initiative. Yeah, thank you, and many thanks from the Shield team. I also thank all the delegates participating in this webinar. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.